You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit ppe.mercatus.org. Thank you. Um, kind of changed the title of the talk, but not the substance. Uh, in, in some ways, titles can be a little bit arbitrary. Uh, behave, uh, rationality after behavioral economics is one way to approach it. Another way to approach it is universal rationality versus ecological rationality. So I'll kind of try to do a little bit of everything here. Uh, this is a, a big story. Um, so let me just um, go through some of the basics, and then maybe in the question and answer period we can get into more, more detail. Uh, there shouldn't be an H in Nicholas. Um, okay, who was Nicholas Bourbatsky? Now, for those of you who know some mathematical theory, you will know that Nicholas Bourbatsky was not a person, but he was a group of people, a group of mathematicians writing under the name of Bourbatsky, who from about 1934 to 1982 uh, were writing about putting mathematics on a firmer axiomatic uh, foundation. Um, they were trying to give uh, strong axiomatic foundations to various branches of, of mathematics, and they pursued this work uh, for many years uh, under this collective name. Now, their work in mathematics influenced work that was going on in economics regarding uh, preference rationality and uh, belief rationality. So let me uh, talk a little bit about what the Borbatki people were doing and how their axiomatic uh, approach differed from the axioms or the axiomatic approaches that people pursued in the 19th century. First of all, uh, Bourbatki referred to axioms of the structure. They were concerned with not axioms that were substantive statements uh, about either mathematics or the world, but axioms that had to do with the structure of um, mathematical relations, and in particular, uh, binary ordering relations, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, unlike the, uh, the 19th century approach, uh, as I said, these were not axioms of specific content. So they were not, going along those lines, they were not even axioms that were particularly self-evident. Uh, the old notion of axioms is that you begin with certain self-evident propositions. These were not, uh, the, the approach they were taking was not about self-evident propositions, but propositions of convenience, uh, abstract propositions that were convenient to choose as axioms for a system. And they were to uh, provide a foundation for an existing theory. So for example, they didn't expect or intend to replace the calculus, uh, but they intended to give the calculus a firmer axiomatic foundation. So the theory, in a sense, was already there, but the foundations needed to be provided. So you provided foundations that were convenient or conducive to rationalizing uh, the edifice that you already had. So for them, the mathematicians, the axioms were uninterpreted. They were pure mathematical objects. So if you were doing, for example, uh, concerned about binary ordering, uh, you were do doing that in a very abstract way. Uh, the preferences were not uh, the issue, certainly for the, for the mathematicians. And later, even for the economists working in the area, uh, preferences were later an interpretation of the system and not the foundation of the system. So these axioms uh, in the hands of uh, economists, specifically uh, people like Gerard de Brue, um, were 
the structure that binary ordering had to take in order to be rational. So preferences arrive later as a interpretation of the pure mathematical object. So one of the things that this enables you to get away from, if I can jump ahead a little bit, is that if you're starting out with a sort of pure mathematical binary relations and binary ordering, okay, so what we say A is preferred to B, but A is in some sense greater than B, and B is in some sense greater than C, et cetera, et cetera. If you're starting abstractly like that, you are avoiding all of the issues about the psychological or hedonic foundations for preferences, right? In the 19th century, some economists like Jevons and Edgeworth and others tried to give hedonic or benthamite foundations for preferences. So uh, in individuals might prefer A to B if A gave more pleasure uh, than B. Um, there were other psychological theories about why people preferred the things they did. We could abstract from all of that, right, because we're just dealing with abstract binary ordering. Um, so we don't have to talk about any of that. Um, and later, you see, we'll just say, let this ordering relationship be a preference ordering, and it will follow the structure of the abstract mathematics of, of preference ordering. So, in De Bruyne, who wrote The Theory of Value in 1959, which was uh, partly a culmination and partly a, uh, um, a statement of research that had gone on before, he says that allegiance to rigor dictates the axiomatic form of analysis where the theory, in the strict sense, is logically entirely disconnected with its interpretation. Now, to a person who, say, didn't go through this period of the axiomatizing of preference theory, uh, or even for a person who looks at sort of intermediate level textbooks, you kind of wonder, what, what does this mean? That the theory is in, disconnected with its interpretation. Well, it depends on what you mean by theory, right? Theory here, he, for him, means this abstract mathematical, uh, these abstract mathematical relationships. And that's what the theory is. And then later, you interpret the theory by adding this, this preference content. But once you add the preference content, that's not allowed to change the theory. That's just an interpretation. See, the problem is, if you think about preferences rather than binary ordering, you, you have, there are all sorts of connotations that come up with the, the term preferences. Some of them are, are about psychological processes, you introspect, may perhaps you say, well, you know, when I prefer things, when I make uh, choices among options, I think about it in this and that way. You don't want to get into that. That's all psychologism. That's all unnecessary stuff, right? You want to just look at the pure logical relationships. So it helps to develop the theory at very, very abstractly and then impose an interpretation on it, and then any time your intuition doesn't fit with the interpretation, you either ignore the intuition or you sort of force it in the mold. And that's the whole, that's the whole object or framework. Now, the virtue of this, according to De Bruyne, is that it's supposed to promote clarity of expression and end the ambiguity of meaning. So, if you talk about uh, rational preferences, there are certain things you mean by that, and they're very precise. And not only are they precise, but since you're not referring to preferences in the sort of common sense term, uh, meaning of the word, 
you avoid all the ambiguities that common sense has, the, the, the ambiguities of meaning. But as I say, this is the result of dealing with pure mathematical objects. Uh, De Bruyne, there, were some in, there was a couple of interviews with De Bruyne after he won the Nobel Prize, and it, it's revealing some of the things he said. Uh, one thing he says is that uh, he would have preferred to win the Nobel Prize in mathematics. All right, well, you know, sorry about that. Uh, and uh, then he says, making a very odd use of the concept of the invisible hand, he says, but he was very pleased that economists, kind of distancing himself a bit from them, were, and he uses some, like, language something like this, as by an invisible hand could take, you know, that his, his, his uh, structure could, in the hands of economists, even though the structure was not created for the specific purpose of improving economics, could, as an unintended consequence, more than invisible hand, as an unintended consequence, improve economics. And he was very pleased with that. So you get a sense of a man who has a conception of what he did as being somewhat distant from uh, the conception of uh, sort of price theory that many of us had learning it, uh, uh, that it was a, a tool which enabled you to explain, you know, what was going on right out the window here or in, a, in, a, in, a, in the pricing structure of a, a particular industry or in a, you know, why it is that a store might uh, uh, give you um, buy one, get one free rather than charge 50% off. Uh, puzzles like that, which are kind of everyday common sense puzzles, uh, that, that's not his view of what he was doing at all. I mean, he, he was doing a kind of mathematics, and in fact, he should have gotten the prize in mathematics. All right, now why was this uh, done? Well, ultimately, the Bourbatki um, project in mathematics was to give foundations for existing mathematics, say the calculus, all right? They're not changing it, really. I maybe you know, may have little things here, but they're not changing it. They're just giving a foundation for what exists. So, in the same way, economists use this to give a foundation for what already existed, namely the concept of a utility function. What does a utility function require as a foundation to be something coherent and, and theoretically satisfying? How can you put uh, the utility function on a firm foundation? Now, the first thing to, to recognize about this is that there's no, in one sense, theoretical innovation. You have utility functions formal or informal, before, and you have them after. But what you had before was something too tied to specific conceptions of preferences, too much wound up in sort of the psychology of preferences, and something which didn't have a very clearly worked out structure. You know, what are what are rational preferences? So, what they got out of this was that, first of all, uh, that transitivity of preferences or transitivity of the binary relation and a complete ordering of the preference field are the key elements in building utility function. They are more or less the necessary and sufficient conditions. There's a little bit of a nuances here, but more or less the necessary and sufficient conditions for the existence of a utility function is complete ordering and transitivity. Complete ordering, again, is defined 
in such a way that it's not bound to any specific psychological theory. It's purely the abstract mathematics of binary ordering. And the same thing with the, the transitivity, right? So these are, the, these are key elements. And the problem is, though, now the interpretation is imposed. And now everything's going fine for a lot of years. Right? And now behavioral economists come up and they say, oh, well, if you look at these axiomatic foundations, you will find that people don't behave that way. They don't always have complete preference orders. They don't always have transitive preferences. So what does that mean? Do we have to give up the whole ball of wax because the fundamental assumptions are not being met? Or why can we still continue as we did before and not worry about that? For a while, the standard, what I'll call standard economists, relied on the sort of Friedman and other uh, sort of instrumentalist approach and said, well, we don't have to worry about these axioms. Maybe they're not fulfilled in the real world, but once we build a utility function and once we create specific theories about phenomena, we see that economics with these axioms, built on these axioms, still is very good at explaining the world. So that sufficed as an answer for a while. And things went merrily on, and a lot of the behavioral stuff was ignored for a, a while. But then the behavioral economists pushed on. They said, well, look, let's just see how good these economic theories do when trying to understand the world. And one of the first um, uh, victories of... Um, Behavioral economics was in the form of prospect theory, uh, which was a, in some ways, a minor modification of expected utility theory. Uh, but it was a modification that was important and had a psychological foundation. Namely, that what people cared about was not the absolute levels of wealth, but what they cared about was whether something was a gain or loss relative to some baseline. All right, once now you introduce that, which is direct attack on expected utility theory, and expected utility theory is, a, is built on the, the neoclassical axioms and uh, is, is fundamental, then you begin to see the edifice beginning to, to shake. But going back to the, uh, the preference axioms, one of the paradoxes of all of this uh, development of behavioral economics is that although behavioral economic economists have more and more weakened and tried to overthrow the basic neoclassical you know, pre-behavioral analysis, they are wedded to the concept of rationality developed by neoclassical economics in two ways. One, they show that people behave in opposition or contrary to or inconsistent with the neoclassical axioms. So if you don't have any neoclassical axioms to begin with, then you don't quite have the same structure, right? It's, it's neat now because you've got this structure of axioms and then now you go collect evidence showing that the axioms don't apply. So your research is carefully, is, is carefully set out for you. You know what you have to do, what, what, the, what the project is. That's the first thing. But much more importantly is that they continue to believe that the 
neoclassical rationality axioms are the, the, the correct norms for behavior, that people ought to behave that way. So not only do they not behave that way, which in some sense would be a lesser kind of claim, but they ought to behave that way. So the standard economic analysis in this De Bruce sense was correct from a normative perspective, but was not correct from a descriptive, analytical, or positive perspective. So the obvious question now to ask the behavioral economist is why, why are you stopping there? Let's see what you what you know what is implied by what you're what you're doing. Is it so obvious that people ought to behave now that we're getting down to the sort of more literal interpretation of the axioms that people ought to behave in the way the axioms claim that people behave? Seems a reasonable question to ask. But let me step back from that just for a moment. De Bruyne never said that people behave this way. He never said that. He said this is what rational preferences would be like. More, even more, ele more basically, this is what the logic, the mathematical logic of preference ordering, excuse me, of binary ordering. Is, it implies. This is what the, the mathematical logic implies. That was the first statement. Nothing about people, right? This is what mathematical logic implies. Second statement, let's interpret this as preferences. This is what rational preferences imply. Do people act rationally? I'm, I'm, I'm just making this model. I'm not commenting on that. That's why I wanted to win the Nobel Prize. I wanted to win the Nobel Prize in mathematics. You don't criticize a mathematician for developing mathematics that doesn't comport with, you know, something you see in the world. It's about an abstract world. All right, but the behavioral economists have interpreted this normativity as being prescriptive or normative in the sort of colloquial sense of the word, when it really is, was I suggest that people like De Bru meant it as normative in the sense that if you wanted to behave as a, as a good mathematical, uh, as a good mathematical agent would behave, this is what you would do. This is how you would do it. All right, so let's talk about complete ordering. Does rationality in the broad sense of the word, appropriate behavior, require internal omniscience. That is to say, you know all your, your compl complete preference ordering of everything in your, opportunity, in, uh, in your opportunity set. All of the feasible options, right, that are there before you, you're able to completely order them. Well, that would mean that, in this sense, it would be a violation of rationality to say, well, I've never, I've just never thought about it. I don't know. Now, if you were forced to choose A over B, and let's say you just said, I've never thought about whether I like A more than B, I've no, I don't know. The fact that you might choose A over B doesn't necessarily mean that that problem of attitude or mental preference has been resolved, you're, you're being forced, let's say, by the nature of the experiment or whatever. I, I should, you know, if you don't choose in the next few seconds, I'm going to shoot you or, or I'm going to, you know, gonna take money away from you or something. Well, then you choose. Well, does it mean that necessarily you have completely ordered, right, in this nice way, uh, your mental preferences? All right, transitivity. This is, uh, a lot could be said about these things, but I'm just saying a few things here. Um, Sen gives a good example of um, a violation of transitivity that seems perfectly reasonable. 
Uh, he says, oh, look, if a large apple is preferred to an orange, if an orange is preferred to a small apple, then by transitivity, a large apple must be preferred to a small apple. But, he says, suppose a person sees a choice between a small, app, small apple and a large apple, and he says, I can't take the large apple. Why? Because it would be rude to do so. Well, then he chooses the small apple. He violates transitivity. Now, a lot of things you can say here. First, you can say, look, he violates transitivity. But if you're insistent that that is a horrible, horrible thing and you can't allow it, right, then you could try to reinterpret. And I'm going to tell you right now, you can always, unless you're not very clever, you can always reinterpret to preserve transitivity, right? You can say, for example, that there's really two things being chosen, or, or there's an additional constraint, let's put it this way, additional constraint. I want the bigger apple subject to the constraint that I don't violate manners. And you can pursue that a bit, and you can reestablish transitivity. But the fact is, you wouldn't have thought of doing that unless you saw the violation of transitivity in the first place. And if you feel that the violation of transitivity is reasonable in the broad sense, then you go back and, and force it to fit transitivity. I'm not sure what you're accomplishing from a normative perspective. You might be accomplishing something from a more technical, analytical perspective, but from a normative perspective, I'm not sure what you're, because whether it makes sense to go back and, and force it into transitivity, depends upon whether the violation makes some broad sense, broader than just transitivity. And so then when you go back and change it, suddenly everything is harmonized. But it's only harmonized because it made sense in the first place to deviate from at least the mechanical version of transitivity. Secondly, um, transitivity of preferences is not a, uh, a sort of a, they say a, a free-floating uh, logical requirement. Uh, it depends upon a specific interpretation uh, of ordering along a real number line, and then you can get an implication of transitivity. But there are other, other ways of conceptualizing uh, preferences. Uh, you know, if you choose, um, let's say you have three characteristics uh, that you think are important, and you choose the object with the top two, uh, you can, you can uh, then be faced with different objects which uh, embody those characteristics in different respects. Uh, you can get intransitive preferences out of that, uh, out of that exercise. Uh, so it's kind of like the equivalent of a Condorcet paradox for individuals. Uh, and nothing wrong with that. All right, Bayesian updating. Uh, maybe I'll spend a little less time on this. Uh, the interesting thing about Bayesian updating, it's supposed to be the canonical form of rational learning, the, the basic form of rational learning. We had rational preferences, right? The rational structure of preferences. Uh, and now we have rational uh, updating, rational learning. The curious thing about that, uh, about Bayesian updating, is that the, the, the rationality aspect only begins uh, once you've got prior probability, right? But the funny thing is, your prior probabilities are completely unconstrained. So you can assume anything. Um, in any application of this, you know, the, the analyst, the economist, has to make specific assumptions about what prior probabilities you begin with. But it's really a theory, as it's called, is a theory of updating. Taking your priors, where do you go from there? Um, so, constraints on priors. Well, it's in the behavioral literature, this issue comes up. Uh, under the uh, rubric of um, neglect, neglecting or neglect of base rates. 
they want to say, well, people, because of all psychological problems uh, or issues, neglect base rates. Base rates are interpreted here as prior probabilities. Let me give an example. Um, you, uh, you see or you read about an accident, an airplane accident. It's very spectacular and the news media beat it to death and you keep hearing it for days, and all that. So then, you're about to take a flight. Now, any Bayesian would say, it's fine to update your probability that uh, the plane's gonna crash on the basis of this event. That's fine. But base rate neglect, right? If it really swings your estimate tremendously, you're being irrational. Why? Because you have this whole history of airplane uh, travel with certain base rate of accidents. And one accident shouldn't turn all that upside down. And in fact, they show that people do, or they get nervous or whatever, uh, and therefore they're irrational, right? Again, neoclassical structure is weakened. Now, you know, we can get into issues like how, how they perform the studies uh, in the sense of like what, uh, what behavior is being measured. Um, there, was a, um, there was a study done by Gary Becker and Jonah Rubinstein a number of years ago uh, on uh, a similar issue regarding um, uh, terrorism in Israel during the Second Intifada. And uh, people being afraid of uh, cafes or buses where the bombs were going off. And what uh, Becker and Rubenstein show in an empirical uh, analysis is a number of things, but one of the things they show is that uh, the period of time in which people had this uptick in fear uh, was fairly short, a week. All right, but, you know, a week is too much for the Bayesian updater. I mean, why should, that's too much. Okay. So what they go on to show is, um, maybe we'll talk about this later, but what they go on to show is that people who had the most at stake in terms of taking buses or going to cafes, the people who were the more intensive users of those services, were not affected. So when it really mattered to concentrate the mind, they seem to be not neglecting base rates. All right, but you know, one of the reasons that you, uh, base rates are, are uh, sometimes, they're never really neglected, even any of the studies completely, they're kind of underweighted relative to Bayes' theorem. Uh, but you know, there's always a chance the causal structure of the environment may change. Uh, Gigerenza gives an example of um, a decision about where to let your young children play. Uh, you can let them play near the lake, or you can let them play under a tree. Now, uh, in, in, um, in, this, in this case, the assumptions are that there hasn't been an accident near the lake. Um, one of the types of accidents that are envisioned is a crocodile coming out. I don't know, crocodiles inherit, inhabit lakes, I wouldn't know. That's nature. Uh, in New York, we don't have it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and, eat the, and eat the kid. Or the wind will blow the tree down. And, okay, all right? Now, the, the crocodile thing hasn't happened in a long, long time. So now the parent hears, yesterday, a kid got eaten by a crocodile near the lake. Now, there have been more recent in more numerous cases of children playing under trees and the wind blowing the tree down and hurting the child. What just happened? See that? Parent gets upset, says, go play under the tree, not, not <laughs> near the, the lake. 
Is that irrational? Is that a violation of Bayes' theorem? Well, Bayes' theorem, as I said, doesn't tell you what your priors should be. Suppose you believe that the causal structure has changed, right? Uh, you've been reading about global warming and something, and the lake is getting warmer. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe, but please excuse my, uh, my natural science here, I don't know anything, but uh, suppose with warmer lakes, the, uh, the crocodiles get more feisty or something. Uh, and, they, you know, they find their tastes change and they find children more delicious than they did before. <laughs> or, or something like that. Right, then, then that example is, is not only a, a, an instance, right, but it is maybe a signal that the causal structure of the lake and the, uh, and the problem has changed. Could be. You can't say on Bayes' theorem whether that's rational or not. You just have to accept it. All right, now there's some other issues, but I want to just let's skip those. All right, so now, ecological rationality. All of this has been a discussion of whether there is, as neoclassical economists have traditionally argued, a universal rationality or universal conception of rationality which can be applied everywhere. Remember, in the De Bruyne idea, it's independent of his interpretation, the logical structure. So can you take that logical structure and simply apply it Everywhere. Now, for those of you who think this sounds a lot like Ludwig von Mises, I'm going to tell you right now it's not. So we can go back to that. Uh, can we apply this universal structure everywhere? We don't have to, you know, one of the reasons I became an economist is I didn't, I felt like being an economist, you didn't have to know anything about facts. Sort of. <laughs> let, let me explain to you why. In the good old days, you had a pretty robust theory, and with a lot, you learned a few things, and you could talk about the economics of marriage, you could talk about the economics of uh, drug prohibition, you could speak on many, many subjects, and you could speak with authority. You had, you know, you had uh, Val Ross, Pareto, Marshall, you have all these people standing behind you, and you could speak to the world with great authority, and you didn't have to dig into all the nitty gritty. You could learn some facts, and then you can just uh, do some regressions. And it was, you know, it was great. And there was one theory. I was thinking about majoring in history or philosophy. I said, but I've got a million and one different theories. How am I going to decide? I, want, I just want one theory, and then I could just apply it. And that's why I went into economics. And now I got a lot of theories to deal with, so I, I got, didn't get what I thought I would get. Um, all right, so is there one universal rationality or not? Now remember uh, a, a term which I found very, uh, very useful that uh, Roger Koppel used in his talk. He talked about local truth. <clears throat> and um, there is this view of ecological rationality uh, as being as an as a interpretation of what Herbert Simon was all about. That's different from the, what behavioral economists uh, are talking about. Uh, here we're talking about, instead of this universal rationality, agents use domain-specific heuristics to make choices and to formulate uh, their beliefs. And the quotation that, the full quotation from Simon is important because it gives you his two blades of a scissor. He says that human rational behavior is shaped by scissors whose two blades are the structure of the task environments and the computational capabilities of the actors. Now, modern behavioral economics ignores the structure of the task environment and just focuses on the computational capabilities. And the computational capabilities of the actor are not up to the neoclassical standard. And therefore, they are subject to mistakes by that standard. So, we can contrast the Kahneman-Tversky branch of uh, uh, behavioral economics called the heuristics and biases approach. And they say that heuristics are shortcuts due to our limitations that result in systematic and predictable errors. If you think of sort of 
Bayesian updating, the neoclassical rational structure, all of these, uh, all of this apparatus of the standard approach as being what people ought to be doing, then you can't help but think that people have cognitive limitations that don't permit them to do that. And if you go on to think that what comes out of the standard analysis is what people should do and should believe, then when they don't do it, they are, in, they are exhibiting biases. Bias is relative to that standard. Now, the other approach, also based on Herbert Simon, uh, of Gerd Gigerenzer and his research group at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, view heuristics as fast. Kahneman Tversky would agree with that. Use little information. Kahneman Tversky would agree with that. And in appropriate environments are more accurate than standard rational models. Now that's the part that's the difference. Now, if heuristics can in appropriate environments do better than the neoclassical approach, then there's no reason to say that failure to use that approach constitutes some sort of bias or deficiency. So, some experiments. Uh, probably the one that uh, gives the nicest um, summary viewpoint is that uh, Gigerenzer sets out a, an experiment with 20 prediction problems. And it concerns which of two objects score higher on some criterion. So, for example, which city is larger? So they'll have pairs of cities. Uh, which Chicago school has a higher dropout rate? We'll have Chicago schools. And so he compares four methods of making a decision. And I'll explain what these methods are. Take the best, minimalist, tallying, and multiple regression. So let's, let's explain what they are and see what the consequences are of the different methods. All right. So the idea with respect to the first three is that individuals uh, will use cues or characteristics that have validity and prediction. Uh, let, me, let me give an example. Suppose you're trying to uh, decide which of two cities has the higher population. Then take the best works like this. You have a list of cues ordered in a certain priority, that is to say, what you believe to be the priority of their predictive ability. So you may, this is just an example, you may uh, start with, well, if I recognize the city as the capital of its country, and the other one is not a capital of its country, I'll take the capital. That's the end. The first one on whatever cue you're using that gets a yes, with the other one getting a no, that's the one. We take the best. So if that doesn't work, let's say they're both capitals of the country, then you go to the second cue. Does it have a soccer team? One does, one doesn't, then you stop. Right? So the stopping rule is you get one yes, you get a yes and a no, you stop. You get two yeses, you keep going on, if you get two no's, you keep going on, all right? Let's take the best. Very simple. Minimal, minimalist. The only difference here is that the cues are, are in random order. They are not ordered in the priority of their predictive ability in the, in the, in the uh, agent's mind. So they're just random. And then you use take the best. That's the minimalist. You can see how that doesn't require you to know much of anything. It just sort of requires you to have some idea that these things are predictive, but you really don't know in what order they're predicted. Tallying. You choose the one with the most yes cues. So that means you've got to go through your whole list of cues and count up tally, right, the one with the most yeses, and that's the one you choose. 
Finally, multiple regression. So this would be, you regress the population onto these characteristics or cues, right? You come up with certain regression equation coefficients, and you make your prediction on the basis of the regression equation. So you're not given the, the data, but somebody else does it, provides you the regression equation, and then you choose on the basis of that. Now, some of these are frugal, and some of these are greedy in terms of the information they require. Take the best, and minimalists are frugal. Don't require much information. Tallying, you got to go through the whole list and find yeses on everything, and multiple regression is the greediest of all. So now, let's look at the accuracy. Take the best, 72% accurate, and uses 2.4 cues. So after, on average, after 2.4 cues, you get a decision and you're 72% accurate. Tallying is pretty close, same, pretty much the same, 71% accuracy, but 7.7 .7 cues. It's a greedier. Heuristic. Multiple regression, 69% uh, accuracy, 7.7 .7 cues. And minimalist, 66% accuracy, but 2.2 .2 cues. It's the least greedy of all, but it's not as accurate. So take the best is the best. Now, take the best isn't the best all the time. It's domain specific to certain kinds of problems. Um, Gigarenza goes into uh, some of that in his, in his studies. But the point is that here we have an example, and you know, there have been many sort of experiments uh, showing similar things, that you have a heuristic which is frugal, it requires m much less information than the standard approach, say, of multiple regression would, and yet it is more accurate. Even if it was just as accurate, that would be enough of a claim, but it is more accurate. Now, you know, why heuristics can be better? Uh, this challenges a truism, or at least has been considered a truism in economics, that the more information used, uh, the better the outcome. Let me say this, I think maybe the best explanation of why this is not always the case is if you think about the distinction between prediction and curve fitting. You know, once you know you have all the data, you can refine your model uh, and your empirical um, estimations in such a way as you can, in effect, get a curve theory, read that as theory, that fits the data very, very well. You just have to keep changing your theory uh, as you, uh, you know, to adjust and get closer and closer fits. That's curve fitting. Multiple regression is great at that. But what Gigerenza is saying is the difference between curve fitting and prediction. Because prediction involves going outside of that data into a world in which you see new things that you, you know, it's not part of the old data, new observations. Many of these observations may not be observations from a, um, a sample that meets all the criteria of the sort of neoclassical small world, uh, you know, unambiguous outcomes, uh, clear-cut probabilities, and all of that stuff comes from a messier, uncertain world. And what happens in that world is the data comes out in a way in which there are random factors mixed in with systematic factors. And if you've done curve fitting, what you've done is you tortured the random factors to make them appear as if they were systematic. And so the, 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 the fit, the, what you get out of the curve fitting doesn't predict very well in new data. So what the test really is, is how does it do in new data? Not how does it do once you've 
seeing what the results are, and then you go back and you, and you basically adjust your theory, your parameters and all that to get a good uh, curve fitting. So in that kind of an environment, an environment of novelty, uh, which is different from the data that you already had, heuristics using less information can be better than using more information. Now, let me end up with what I call my Hayekian addendum. This is a seminar on Wall Street Economics. So what has this got to do with Wall Street Economics? Now, uh, briefly, I'm going to talk about this. I, I wrote a paper which, for a, a conference that was held here at the Mercatus about a year ago called Hayek and the Rationality of Individual Choice, and it's available on SSRN, um, which talks about this, what I'm going to talk about now in, in, in greater detail. So if you want to look, you can, you can look. I think that the ecological view of rationality is implied by uh, Hayek's work on, or at least I don't know if it's implied, but it's, it's consistent with Hayek's work on reason and rules. A little background. Earlier in his intellectual career, Hayek talked a lot about uh, in, the, um, in the, in articles like the meaning of competition and the uh, uh, economics and knowledge and others, uh, what he called the pure logic of choice. Now let's clarify what the pure logic of choice is and, and some of the stages here. First, there's Mises' human action. Human action is purposeful behavior, right? That is the most general form of rationality because what that Purposeful behavior is the requirement for being an agent, not just an economic agent, but an agent, right? If you're not engaging in purposeful behavior, you're not an agent. You are, you know, some animal or a reflex, uh, it's a reflex uh, um, activity. Uh, so the most primitive, not primitive, but the most minimal sense of rationality is purposeful behavior, okay? Now, Getting one level more concrete than that is the pure logic of choice. The pure logic of choice is basically the, uh, the Walras, Pareto, uh, Jevons notion of rational behavior, uh, probably epitomized by the, uh, the equimarginal principle. No axiomatic foundations. Right, just thought, you know, well, the rational agent would allocate his last penny so that it produces the same, you know, his pennies in, so that they produce the same result in each one of the uses available. So it's not, it's not, it doesn't have the, you know, firm foundations, but that's pure logic of choice. And many of the uh, conclusions of the pure logic of choice are not changed by all of this axiomatic stuff. Of, the Bruin, et cetera, okay. But then there comes a much more specific level of rationale. And that is talking about, say, the structure of rational preferences being the transitive, or talking about rational belief as involving Bayesian updating. It's a lot more specific, a lot more confining um, notion of rationality, right? Now, I think that what happened is, in, in Hayek's career, intellectual career, uh, as he became in, more interested in law, he also became much more interested in rules. And his emphasis shifted from emphasizing the, the role of the pure logic of choice to talking about rules of behavior. And so, He's talking about the need for abstract rules, right, in the coordination of successive actions. Rules, not adherence to the pure logic of choice. You go on, what he views these rules as one of their features is the rules, we limit our range of choice under the same abstract rule. They are frugal to use Gigerenz's term. They economize on information in the world. 
we make decisions in part by narrowing down our range of choices according to some rule. Now, Hayek is very, you know, abstract. I mean, he's very, uh, he doesn't like to give examples. Um, then further, he says, well, look, it's not a single rule. Right? It's not that there's one single rule that you apply all of the time is going to give you the right answer. But it's a system of rules, a hierarchy of rules. So let me, in conclusion, show you how take the best fits the hierarchy of rules. First of all, you see how it's, it's frugal. It eliminates various options, ways of choosing, gets it down to something very basic with limited information. So, a more, a fuller form of the take the best would begin with the recognition rule. So even before you engage in take the best, you see two cities. Which is the biggest population, bigger population? Well, you recognize the name of one city, you don't recognize the other. Stop. You choose the one you recognize. You recognize them both. Then you go on to the list of cues. Right? And then you go down the list of cues until you get yes, a yes, and a no. Well, notice, you've got sort of a hierarchical application of rules, or a, maybe it's one rule, or some lexicographical rule. But you, you begin with the rule of recognition. That doesn't work. The next rule is take the best. Right? Now, in a full analysis, you would have a whole series of rules. And you would, if, if, if one doesn't give it to you, and the second one doesn't give it to you, you go to the third one, right? And it's a specific hierarchy of rules whose object is, is to facilitate decision-making, not according to a, the pure logic of choice, but according to a frugal uh, use of heuristics. Now, finally, does this mean that all of that's out? In other words, all of that pure logic of choice is out, baby with the bathwater out. No. I mean, in the, in the sensory order and elsewhere, Hayek makes it clear that there are different kinds of environments, similar to Gigerenzi. In an environment which I will describe uh, using the savage term as a small world where probabilities are, are known, where the list of options is, is there, things are pretty much stable. You can, you can use the traditional analysis. It'll work. But in a world of uncertainty, in a world where causal structures might change, uh, in a world that you're, in which you're not familiar with all of the questions or all the options, then the idea is we shift to rules. I think that's Hayek's argument. And I think that's basically the argument of the uh, Gigerenza group on, uh, on heuristics. You know, if I make you a really simple problem, right, and I, I give you all the information, you can do the traditional analysis, and it'll give you a good answer. But don't forget, there's two issues. One is the structure of your environment, and the other is the limitation of your intellectual capacity, your cognitive ability. And together, recognition of both parts of the uh, system uh, lead us to, a, I believe, a broader conception of rationality, one which is perfectly consistent with Mises and human action, purposeful behavior, but one that achieves the individual's purposes much more efficiently and frugally than the use of the standard high maintenance, high uh, information uh, neoclassical analysis. Okay, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. 
To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the F.A. Hayek program, visit ppe.mercatus.org.